This week on the Writer's Detective Bureau. The DNA of twins, the first 48, and discovering your characters. I'm Adam Richardson, and this is the Writer's Detective Bureau. Welcome to episode number 19 of the Writer's Detective Bureau podcast, coming to you from Grenada in the West Indies. Recently, Joanna Penn was talking about Patreon on the Creative Pen podcast. She said, I think patronage is one of the most powerful things that you can do to support creators that you want to continue hearing from. It's one of those ways that you can support people and encourage them to do the things that are either useful to you or just putting good stuff in the world. Regardless of whether you support me on Patreon, I absolutely think you, as a creator of stories, should look into setting up your own Patreon account. You can learn more at writersdetective.com forward slash Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. A huge thanks to my patrons Joan Raymond, Guy Alton, Natasha Bajima, Natalie Borelli, Joe Trent, Siobhan Pope, Leah Cutter, and Ryan Kinmill for helping me keep the lights on in the bureau. And some of your money may have gone to beers while I'm sitting here on the beach in Grenada. You can find links to their author websites in the show notes by going to writersdetective.com forward slash 19. This week's first question comes from C.A. Phipps, and she asks, would identical twins have the same DNA? Is it possible that they don't? So there is a relatively new type of sequencing called massive parallel sequencing, MPS, that um, is possible to identify twins, uh, like separating the twins when it comes to looking at mutations. But it is still yet to be um, totally proven, and it is not yet accepted for forensic use, meaning it has not made it through the trials and tribulations and research for it to be considered acceptable science for the courtroom. Um, so this is one of those watch this space kind of advances that I would anticipate will be more common in the next 10 years or so. If you recall back in the uh, mid to late 90s, there were some major leaps and bounds with forensic science when it came to DNA. And a lot of that had to do with being able to replicate the sequence of DNA to a usable length. And now I'm grossly oversimplifying this, and I'm not a forensic science expert, but that repeated sequencing um made the basics of, you know, finding DNA and using it for forensic use possible. And it opened up a lot of investigative tools to us. So it's my basic understanding, having researched this for this question, that for massive parallel sequencing, um, you would need to obtain samples from both of the twins and then compare that against the evidence sample to determine which one was the um, donor, essentially, of the evidence sample. And they're really looking into mutations um, that are very specific and require a significant amount of a DNA sample for them to look at. Um, so there has been one case that I know of that explored massive parallel sequencing to try to determine which twin was responsible for the crime, but they ended up he was convicted, but he was not convicted based upon the science. Uh, he was actually convicted based upon um, witness testimony and other evidence. So this still has yet to be proven for courtroom use. This was kind of this, I guess, was circa 2014 or so. But I think in the very near future, um, if it hasn't been proven by by now already, um, it will definitely be doing so in the very near future. Either that or we will hear that massive parallel sequencing based on research uh, does not actually identify it. So the misconception, or I shouldn't say misconception, generally speaking, the typical DNA profiling that does that happens in normal criminal cases does appear to look like the DNA is the same for both people. Um, so this new stance or this new type of massive parallel sequencing um, could be very important. And of course, the reason why determining which twin is important is because that is your reasonable doubt. The reasonable doubt, um, you know, unless you're charging both for the same crime with some sort of 
um, co-conspirator thing. You need to be able to identify which person, beyond a reasonable doubt, did it. And you can't simply convict one because he matches the DNA when the other could be the suspect. So it would be um, a huge advancement for a pretty small percentage of cases, but it could be very important. So thank you very much for your question, CA. You can find her work at cafips.com. And I will link to probably three different uh, links for massive parallel sequencing in the show notes if you go to writersdetective.com forward slash 19. This next question comes from Tony Fagioli, and you can find his work at TonyFagioli.com. And he says, it helps with the spelling if you say the last name is spelt like Pasta Fagioli, except with one extra G. So I hope you find Tony on Amazon and at his website, TonyFagioli.com. Now, Tony asks, when working a case, we always hear the first 24 to 48 hours is the most crucial. But how much of that is an individual detective going to work before he clocks out and goes home to rest? Unless you work for a giant agency that has a night shift for detectives, most agencies don't. Um, you'll get the you'll start working that call until or that case until you are pretty much exhausted and you have to go sleep. Then they may call in. It's been my experience that they will call in detectives that were not part of the case initially to come in and, and continue on while the case agent goes and takes a nap or goes home and, you know, gets a night's sleep and, and comes back refreshed. In that 24 to 36 hour mark, you will get, you know, maybe an eight hour break or six hour break to get some sleep and uh, take a shower, that kind of thing. Um, but very often it's just going to exhaustion. You know, and really that's the detective that is um, just focused on working the case, but then it's the detective sergeant, the boss, uh, or perhaps a detective lieutenant who will be in charge of coming up with a schedule to make the investigation um, a little more sustainable when it comes to the manpower or woman power issues. So I hope that helps, Tony. Thanks again for your question. And you can find Tony on Amazon or at Tony Fagioli with two G's. Last week, I talked about sending your characters to therapy to learn more about where they develop their voice and how their interactions with other characters or other people may come about and get you, get you as their creator to get to know them better. And I also asked for some insight as to what you do um, with your characters, since I'm not actually a writer. Um, and Siobhan Pope, one of our frequent patrons on Patreon, Siobhan wrote back and said, loved your latest episode, particularly your opening segment on character development. I actually took two days out of my writing schedule recently to look at backstory because I felt I didn't have a strong enough handle on the historical influences on a number of my characters. I took an hour to interview my murderer and ask him the questions I wanted answers. I wrote it out like an interview, asking the questions I needed answered. The answers were fascinating and opened up angles to the story I hadn't anticipated and turned him into a much more complex, intelligent, and nasty character than I had anticipated. I'm aiming to finish my first draft in late January, early February, before starting my second draft in April. My hope is to have enough downtime to interview several of the other characters who've been reticent about revealing their history and makeup to me so far. It's the same concept you articulated, but I'm more interrogatory than exploratory in my questions when I talk to my characters. They know their stories and motivations, fears, and desires better than I do. Cheers, Siobhan. Thank you so much, Siobhan, for your email, and I do find that fascinating. And the reason I'm sharing it with you guys, the listeners, I wanted you to, um, first and foremost, know that it's normal to talk to your characters like this, to treat them as if they are completely separate individuals. It may seem weird at first, but I really encourage you to do so. Because if you don't go into your own head to hear the voices of these characters, your writing's going to suffer. And your characters will all sound just like you do in real life with your voice. So really explore your subconscious with this. Because you know when you're asleep and dreaming, the people in your dreams often feel real, right? So just like your characters, they're just in your head. So don't feel weird. Go ahead and interrogate them like Siobhan did. Or send them to therapy like I talked about last week. 
you might even, you know, this might be a good Christmas gift to yourself or to your characters, is to pick up a party card game like Disturb Friends or Hot Seat or Never Have I Ever. Because those games will ask questions that, you know, normally are used like as an icebreaker for your friends at a party, a cocktail party. But it might get you to reveal more about the characters you have living in your head that you didn't even know. All right, I realize I'm cutting this episode short, but I am headed back out to the beach while I'm still here in Grenada in the West Indies. And I have to say, I absolutely love it here. If you haven't made it to Grenada, definitely put it on your bucket list. So I will leave you with Rasta Frank, who we met on the beach just last night. Who won't pull it out? Better try to reach some higher grounds. Let us get be friends. Sit on the garden angel over us. See now the lovely in the wilderness. To be the bit of dirt. When you